Hey, the meeting's in here. Don't pay attention to these people. Keep going. All right. So we were just looking at my invisible 80 meter four square, <laughs> which you could see really well if you were actually there. Um, anyway, I'm going to continue going ahead here with the pictures. Uh, you can see it a little better, and you can see one of the collapses hanging down. Basically, this is. Turn the lights off. Oh, good idea. Lights off. I'm here for a call. Yeah. Now watch out, you don't trip over stuff now. There you go. Okay. Oh, okay. oh, look at that. You can see the four square. Uh, <laughs> what you're actually seeing are is twine, number 36 twine. Now one of the important things about a four square, or really any wire antenna is, is you want to have the separation held in place. Well, that's a problem when you have elements that are hanging off the trees. How do you hold these things in place? So there are no towers here. Everything is pre-mounted. I've become exceptionally good with a slingshot, um, but you're dealing with trees. They rip the hell out of antennas, especially in the winds that I have. So uh, one of the problems is how do you maintain the integrity between the antenna itself as a whole and how do you keep the differences, you know, the different lengths between the antennas vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. And the only way I figured out how to do that is with twine. I used to use rope, but that put far too much weight and drag on the antennas. So I went with twine. I found number 36 to be just strong enough to pretty much hold its integrity even in ice, although it sags badly. So, and I had everything both in the shape of a box. So each of the, each element itself has a twine going to three other elements, holding it in place. So, and then on the outside of the box, I have separate twine pulling the elements in opposite directions into the trees, holding the radials above ground. No, uh, no, he's really close. Oh, well, how about, yeah, I could say it over here. Right okay, as long as yeah. because, we're, because there's so much background noise. Yeah. And we'll also maybe close the door. That'll help to reduce the background noise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the idea like, being, you need to have tension in the different directions to hold the elements in place. And it does matter because even if an element gets too close into another element. Is this element. a loop or four? Uh, these are four. Four verticals. These are four quarter wave uh, wire verticals, if you will. Like. Four quarter wave with, wire verticals. With elevated radials. And the, reason okay. that, the reason that they're elevated is because it, I'm able to keep the most of the radiation efficiency very high, as opposed to if we're on the ground, where you'd have to put down about a minimum of 30 radials per element. Plus, also, by having the radials elevated, the, radi the elevated radials are just about or at or near the top of the ledge on the side here. So that, as opposed to if we were in the ground, where I'd be losing 15 or 20 degrees of potential signal. So in other words, uh, northeastern element here with radials down here and the feed point down here, um, I would be, the minimum wave angle coming in would be 15 degrees, give or take. With the elevated radials and the feed points here, there's virtually no difference with the uh, with the effects from the hill. Now, of course, uh, I use four elevated radials per element. So generally speaking, it's often down to three, and in the winter after an ice storm, it's usually down to two. In theory, you only need one, but realistically speaking, you want to have more than that. But it is a headache. This is the bottom. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, each of the elements goes up a quarter wavelength, um, and unfortunately, I am not able to get pictures to show you of what it looks like. On 80 meters, this would ordinarily be about 64 feet high, plus off the ground. Well, I can't do that with trees, so what I had to do is I had to put in rope guys and have the ropes go into the tree and ropes going across, and then physically, I had to, through a lot of trial and error, actually figure out the right distance and the amount that the element could go vertically and then actually have it uh, attached to the ropes to go horizontally. So I don't have straight vertical polarization on any of these elements. It's a combination of vertical and horizontal. And there are times when actually that's helpful and there are times when it's not. But you know, again, you got to do what you got to do. 
The alternative to this would be an inverted V, which wouldn't function nearly as well. Since it's a four square, your inverted L's go out away from the box, point outwards. Well, the radials do. The radials are, you'll get the same. But the bent point. element on the top. Yeah. You're bending bent. away from the box or in the box? Uh, actually, I like to bend towards where I want the RF energy to go, which ah. is to Europe. <coughs> so I have them go in the direction as close to Europe as possible because I want that polarization to go that way. Do you use them on the receiver also? Or oh, absolutely. Uh, it's both receiver and transmit. No question about it. Uh, one of the things that's nice about four squares is that they're also fairly quiet compared to other antennas. So my four square is often as quiet as a beverage. Not always, but a lot of the time. So by putting up a four square, you get a two for really. Not only do you gain on receive and transmit, but you also get a directional low noise antenna as well, which is very nice to have. Uh, it's another shot, you really can't see it unfortunately. A reason. Oh, I know I'm showing you this. You can't see my 40 meter four square. You can see a little bit of the twine. But what you can see is this is the top of the hill. This is the ledge. And then it drops down about 15 feet. Uh, and these are the, the guys from the 10 and 15 foot tower. They come very close to the four square. I used to have the 80 meter four square on the similar slant, and it really did make a difference. You know, having this slope over here definitely help to the west. To the northwest is another hill which is a tiny bit higher, but it really isn't significant. And the northeast is kind of flat. But the nice thing about the 40 meter four square is the trees don't have to be as tall. Because here you're dealing with 33 foot elements. And it's a very, very forgiving antenna as long as you get the radials up about 0.05 wavelength. So for a couple hundred dollars, you can have really a pretty good antenna with dire immediate directional switching. Again, uh, 40 meters, two element, rotatable Yagi at 60, 70 feet, absolutely superior. On 80 meters, good luck. That's why I use a four square. What kind of switching, uh, who do you? Uh, it was contact. That contact, was that box okay. I showed earlier. Um, this is another shot of the 20 meter wire beam. Again, it looks more impressive. These are the guy wires from the, the 10 and 15 meter tower. Uh, this is looking down the hill at my cars and the house over here. This is the ledge on the other side. So there's a ledge right here, about 15 feet high. It drops down like into a little mini valley. Well, I'm, okay. I wanted to stand here so I could talk. Let me back this one. And then there's a ledge on the other side, about 15 feet high. Now what you can't see here is there's an enormous drop off right starting right there at the top of the ledge. This drops about 40 feet in the next 100 feet or so, and then it drops about five or 600 feet into the valley over the next couple of miles. What's your height? Well, my height here above sea level is 800 feet. This ledge here is about 815. Uh, at the bottom of my road is about 300, and down in the valley towards Danbury is about 250. Wow. So it's wonderful to the west. I am very loud to the west. It's a great shot. It's a lot of fun. There's not much volume there. Um, it's decent to Japan, it depends. If the JA signals are coming in closer to north, it's not very good. If the JA signals are coming in more towards the west, I do incredibly well, especially on 10 meters. There are times on 10 meters late in the opening where the wave angle is just right and the JAs are coming in just south enough that I'm almost as loud as the sixes for several hours. It's very magical. It's only at the top of the cycle. It's only happened three times. But when it did, it was absolutely memorable. Uh, and you get a nice view. The irony is, I'm on this amazing hill, which is like flat on top for an extended distance, and you get almost no view unless you stand right over here and look down as you stand mm -hmm. on top of my second story room. Or how better still, you're up in the tower. How close is your nearest neighbor? Uh, nearest neighbor, this one here is about 300 feet. This one here is about 300 feet. And, you know, but it's through the woods. And then there's some 500,000 feet away down here. You can see my towers, but only if you're looking for them. And that's one of the reasons I deliberately chose a back lot. You know, there were nicer houses and there were nicer locations, but I wanted to be basically invisible, which is one of the reasons that I had two towers. And on top of the hill. And on top of the hill, and I didn't blast for guy wires. I didn't want to attract attention. Was this a new forest as it is? 
No, actually, a very interesting it's story. interesting how straight the marks are. Yeah, this is yes and no to the New Forest. Um, this is New Forest in the sense that there is no tree more than 100 years old or 90 years old. I know that because some of the trees that came down in the hurricane and I had a chainsaw them and I could count the rings. So some of these went back to, I would say, right around the end of World War I, which is probably not a coincidence because as people were coming back from the war, farming was big in New England. Although everybody were called rock farmers because you know, that's basically what you were farming. This vegetable garden that I have over here is 28 by 14. I, this was put here because this was the only spot on the property not covered by ledge or the septic field because we don't have, we use well water. And so when I was attempting to plant a garden, I, for years, I was digging out boulders, steel cable, glass, wood, stumps, and everything else, because the SOBs that built this house, this is where they buried it all, <laughs> right over here. And I can tell you that I hauled out by myself many rocks that weighed several hundred pounds with literally a come-along tool or, you know, special attachments to my back, making like, a, you know, a pull horse or a cart horse. Um, so. Oh, anyway, so back to what I was saying, the other hill, which is up a little higher than me, from the top of the hill, which is just about this elevation here, I'm 22 miles from the Atlantic Ocean, okay, looking south down into Long Island. You could stand on the hill a half a mile from me at the, around the turn of the century or around the end of World War I, and you could actually see the ocean. Now, you can't anymore. In fact, you can't see it from uh, from my towers until you get up to 100 feet high. And that's because of all the tree growth and everything else. But occasionally when the big coastal storms come in and the wind comes in just right, you can actually smell the salt there. Mm -hmm. So we actually do get corrosion and unfortunately this is one of the reasons we get such violent winds and violent storms. We're at the nexus of the cold air coming down the Adirondacks plus the storms coming in off the coast and they're literally mixing right in my area. A very bad place to be, but it's very pretty. Um, this is, okay, here's a view of one of the one of the elements of the 80 meter four square. So I have the vertical element coming down out of the tree and out of the rope, and then this is the corner wave phasing line, and for my ballad, so I can reduce the currents that come off, I actually have a series of ferrite beads chosen for specifically the best impedance for that band. Best permeability and then the impedance as well. So is 31? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually it is. Originally I used to use 43 and then I tried a few others and I settled on 31 that tended to work best. So I use 31 for 11680 and I use some 43 for 40. Um, and again, that seems to work best. I want to use the fewest number of beads possible, which cuts down the weight as well as the cost. But I go with anywhere between seven and nine beads. And I actually created a spreadsheet to multiply the impedance and all the time, the permeability and other things so I could figure out the best combination. So it's a lot of work is, involved in this. Does your vertical the radiator beads? go straight up yes, or it, down? Well, it, no, it goes straight up. But the, so it has to go up 6.5 feet? Well, it would if I had a tree that tall, but I don't. So I have a rope that goes across. I have it go as vertical as far as it can, so and I have it attached to the rope. It's an L. How high is the vertical? Yeah. yeah. Well, it de depends on the elements. So, uh, I mean, well, how how tall is that point? Uh, oh, right here. I have this at about, I'd say, 10, 12 feet. It should be higher, but what I found through a lot of painful trial and error is if I have this about 10 or 12 feet, the tension required to hold it up will cause the elements not to break in anything other than a violent windstorm. If I go to 12 to 15 feet, the tension is so strong that even in mild winds, the elements will break. And then it goes, and and then it goes horizontal? Um, it goes no, down and, then it, and then it, yeah, it goes down and it becomes detached and I can't use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a lot of other things that go into play. I, I have a real one-hand relationship with trees as I have through my entire life. I couldn't have my antennas without them, but they cause such nightmarish problems on such an ongoing basis. Very, very high maintenance. Um, anyway, so the reason the way I have this attached is kind of cheap and dirty, but it works. I literally take the end of the element 
and I solder it into the end of an SO239. And the other end of the SO239, I attach the coax to. And then on the little holes on each side, which I drill to be a little wider so they fit the right combination of lugs, I attach each of the quarter wavelength, wavelength radials. It works. Um, the problem is it doesn't do well if there's any tension and stress. And I've been trying to figure out a better method of doing it. I haven't come up with it yet. However, what I have learned is given how frequently these elements detach because of the mechanical stresses on it, um, what I do is if you see this little kind of knob sticking out here, that's a split bolt connector. And what I do is I have a little piece of twine connected to the split bolt connector, tightened to the element as much as I can, about three inches above the connection point, and then I have a tape around the, uh, the ferrites down here in several places with electrical tape. But the idea being that if the element breaks, which they frequently do, this split bolt connector and rope will hold the broken end in place so I can recapture it without having to take the tree down <laughs> to recapture it. Um, and I've had many problems with even dangling around, swinging five feet out of reach, you know, forever. Um, which is another reason why I have pull ropes connected to the other ropes so that the element gets detached and I can't catch it. Fine. I pull out the pull rope. That takes the overhead ropes down and I can catch it again. You learn all these things after a painful trial in our three years. Four squares work amazingly well if you get the space of it. Ah, here we go. Here's a nice close-up. So here's the SO239. And you see where it's just soldered right in there very nicely. And then you have the coax attached here. And then I drill out the holes. And I use brass fittings because they don't rust. Stainless does throw mm. rust. Yes, it gold. does. It, you know, anybody who's used stainless so, knows. So what are you using? Brass fittings. Brass? brass. Yep. So here's brass. They're a little and more that, and that uh, pardon me, a brass will conduct? No. Oh yeah, it conducts well enough. Brass, brass will conduct. Yeah, well yeah, enough. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, and, because, and because it right doesn't have a problem with oxidation, it's actually better. I got a problem. But so, you, you could solve that after the, the, the right. You could, but I like something where I can detach or whatever. Now, all of this is out in the woods. This is about 250 feet from my house. The 160 was out several hundred more feet from my house. Um, it's bad enough when you have to solder something and you have to bring out hundreds of feet of electric, you know, uh, the cables each time on the snow and through the sticker bushes and it's a nightmare. So one of the innovations I made is rather than solder it to this, I would simply have something that I could walk out into the woods with me and just connect with a bolt. You know, a nut and a bolt and a washer and then I'm done. And really it's, you know, it's designed to be as maintenance easy as possible. Again, all things you learn through the years. And whenever you don't learn right the first time, um, you will curse yourself for the next time until you finally arrive at the conclusion, OK, I get it. I'm going to do it that way from now on. And, so, um, and here again is the, is the, the twine, the heavier duty twine connected to the split bolt connector, um, taking some of the tension off this connection when it's flexing in the wind, either this way or this way. or this way or even this way with the weight of the ice. And I've changed how I do it. I used to have it looser, and that just gave it more room to flex, which I didn't understand for a while. So now I have this really, really <coughs> tight so that it <coughs> off a lot of strain. And on the 160, where it goes to a certain point and I can't access it, what I've done is this is actually very, very, very loose. There's no tension on it. And I have, instead of twine, I actually have rope going through oh. one end of this, connecting to a tree, Coffee. almost in line with half of the element, so that the element itself has practically zero stress on it with those violent storms, and it's being supported basically by the rope. That's worked well most of the time, but Mother Nature still finds a way to break it off. What kind of wire is this in there? Uh, this is all um, 14 solid. Uh, copper weld. It does stretch, and what I did was, I used to use 13 poly from the wireman years ago, which used to like to sell at 15 cents a foot. It gets pretty expensive. 
I waited for copper to bottom out after the last market crash in 2008. Right? I waited for market to do went from 425 a pound down to about a dollar ten a pound. And then oh, by the way, coffee's back on again. Anybody want coffee? With all the copper sitting in Home Depot and Lowe's that they weren't selling because nobody wanted to pay their bull market prices. Um, and I had learned from the years that Home Depot won't negotiate anything. Lowe's, on the other hand, yeah, if you find the right person to negotiate. So I said, you know, I see you only have 500 feet of this number 12 sitting on your shelf there. And it's the same price that it was when copper was cost twice as much. I said, um, but you're not selling it. The reason you're not selling it is because it's ridiculously overpriced. So I said, I'll tell you what. You sell how much of the stuff regularly? And of course, he had no idea. I said, check your computer. So he says, well, we sell a 500-foot roll every few months. I said, OK. I said, so how about somebody walks in and is willing to buy 6,000 feet? So that's 12 of those rolls. And I'll pay cash for them. I said, what kind of price can you give me? He said, well, I'll have to go check with my manager and my supplier. I said, hey, that's fine. I'll give you my phone number and go do that. So I didn't hear from him. Uh, it was two weeks later at follow up. And anyway, I contacted the store manager. And I explained what I wanted to do. And I went through the whole story all again. He said, uh, yeah, we're having problems with that guy. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you the price. I'll contact my suppliers. So at that time, they were selling it for approximately $55 for a 500-foot roll. So say about 11, 11 cents a foot. So he came back to me and he said, um, I'll tell you what, we'll, um, we'll sell it for, uh, for $15 a spool. And he said, oh, good, $15. I said, great, when can you have it? So I came in and I effectively bought 12 spools, 500-foot spools, uh, 12, 12.